Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Judith Alberts. Yeah, there we go. Got my screen share going. <clears throat> Welcome to the October 2021 Learn and Grow presentation from the Williamsburg Botanical Garden. My name is Judith Alberts, and I serve on the board of directors. Housekeeping for today. For today. Yes, we are recording and participants will receive a link to the replay within um, 24 to 48 hours, and it's going to be posted on our YouTube channel. Please make sure that your microphone is turned off and we recommend turning off your video for privacy. Close other applications and devices that might interfere with the Zoom platform. Please type your questions in the chat box. Our speaker will answer them at the end. And we're going to be using polls um, during the presentation. So a screen would pop up. This is what it looks like on uh, a laptop. Um, whatever the question is, you submit your answer. Um, if for some reason it doesn't want to close right away, there should be a close button available to you. Please bear with us because, um, yeah, we're all volunteers here. So I see names, lots of names that I recognize. Thank you and welcome back to our regular garden visitors, volunteers, and learn and grow attendees. For new guests, the first thing to know about the Williamsburg Botanical Garden is that it's open every day of the year from 7 a.m. till dusk and it is always free. Canines are welcome to bring their well-behaved humans on a leash. The garden is really quite small. It's only two acres inside Freedom Park. You enter the park, drive about three quarters of a mile, and you actually circle one side of the garden to get to the parking area, which is here and here. And then when you park your car, please use the path from the parking lot, take a sharp right, and go to the garden's decorative entrance. It's much safer than walking in the road. We pack a lot into those two acres with 18 distinct areas, including a wildflower meadow, woodlands, an English style garden, wetlands and native grasses to name only a few. Our garden is intentionally more natural than what you might expect if you hear the words botanical garden. It is definitely not a precisely manicured display of high maintenance plantings. It's more like a wild child garden. We emphasize native plants and practices to support pollinators, including leaving standing stems during the winter to provide food and habitat. It is officially registered as Monarch Butterfly Way Station number 3394. Our mission is to demonstrate environmentally responsible and sustainable gardening techniques and to offer education on related topics. Everything in the garden is tended by dedicated volunteers on a slim budget, and we appreciate the support of the community. Our website is williamsburgbotanicalgarden.org. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, and we receive no funding from any government agency. We hope that you will visit our virtual donations jar. Uh, before COVID, we used to do these in person at the Interpretive Center. Um, and it was a steady stream of income for the garden. And that uh, we really don't really rely on donations. If you'd like to support the garden further, please consider a membership. We are always looking for volunteers. If you order bulbs from Brent and Becky's in Gloucester, if you start at bloomandbucks.com, 25% of your order, which is very generous revenue share, uh, comes to the garden if you select um, our nonprofit. And let's not forget Amazon. Smile.Amazon is the foundation for Amazon. Please start there. You have the option to support any nonprofit of your choice. Of course, we hope that you'll support us. We're now up to 32 supporters. Amazon does not tell us who you are. They don't tell us what you bought or how much you spent. We, this is our, the entire dashboard. That's all we see. And uh, wow, in August, we got $16.06. .06. That's really exciting because 
Um, a year and a half ago, it took us about four years to get a $5 donation because they won't send you, they won't send you money unless you have at least $5 in your kitty. So please use smile.amazon.com if you're gonna do your holiday shopping there. All righty, whoops. So our Facebook page has been unpublished. This happened right after the outage a couple of weeks ago. No warning, no reason, just poof, it was gone. I have on repeated occasions clicked the appeal button. I've tried to report a problem. And of course, anybody who knows anything about Facebook knows that Facebook help is not helpful. So our page is still down. If it doesn't resolve itself, we'll have to start a new page. But our Milkweed Connection group is still up and running. And this is, of course, we're almost at the end of our monarch season. But the group is intended for people who raise monarch butterflies to help each other out when the milkweed supply gets low. Garden is on YouTube. Uh, here's our virtual butterfly festival playlist. And we're also on Instagram. Next month's program features gardening for birds with Dean Shostak, who is a master naturalist and master gardener here in Williamsburg. The last item before I introduce today's speaker is Master Gardeners and Master Naturalists may record this as an hour of continuing education in the Better Impact System. Today's program is Nature's Notebook, The Science of Seasons. Now, phenology is a word I had not heard until six months ago, but it is the study of the cyclical and seasonal natural phenomenon relating to climate and plant life and animal life. And it's one of the simplest ways to track the impact of climate and other environmental changes. And our speaker is Aaron Postumus, who leads USA NPN's outreach and engagement efforts with Nature's Notebook Observers and USA NPN Partners. That is the National Phenology Network. She is also the liaison to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and is working with national wildlife refuges across the country to implement phenology monitoring to meet their resource management goals. Erin received her BA in Environmental Biology from the University of Colorado at Boulder, then worked on a variety of field biology projects around the U.S. and abroad. She first came to the USA NPN as a Peace Corps Fellow in 2010 during her graduate program at the University of Arizona. In 2013, she was awarded a Master's of Science for her research on wildlife species diversity. This is the website for the USA National Phenology Network. And they're on Facebook and Twitter and uh, Whoever, let anyone who is the administrator for Nature's Notebook <laughs> on Facebook page, let them be aware that uh, not to rely on that because boy, poof, Facebook can just do crazy things to you. So thank you, Erin, and welcome. And I am going to stop my share and turn the screen over to you. Thanks so much, Judith, for that welcome. And thank you, everybody, for being here to learn all about phenology. So what I'm hoping to talk to you about today is what phenology is and the many, many applications that phenology has to all sorts of different um, things like um, public health and natural resource management and recreation. And then I'm also going to be talking to you about how you can get involved in um, actually tracking changes in plant and animal activity, either at your own home or at the gardens. Start my slideshow here. So as Judith mentioned, um, you may not have heard of the word phenology, but it is simply the timing of life cycle events of plants and animals and their relationship with the climate and other abiotic factors. Um, the word phenology, it comes from the Greek phaino, which means to show or appear, 
you can think about um, the word phenotype versus genotype. So phenotype is the appearance of the genes. Um, so that is simply what the, the concept means. We kind of prefer that it was called seasonology because that would be a little bit more uh, easy to understand and intuitive rather than phenology, which is kind of a jargony kind of word. So um, phenology is a great way to really see the changes in plants and animals and see how they're responding to um, temperature and precipitation and other environmental factors. So I like to use this example, <clears throat> thinking about um, how the weather has seemed to you this year. So if you think back to how it's been since the beginning of the year in Williamsburg, do you feel like this year has been on average warmer than average or cooler than average or about the same, or maybe you're not sure and um, we'll see how it how your your feeling stack up to what um, we've seen in the the temperature data okay the poll is launched and we will <clears throat> we've got 10 of 17 we'll give it another minute or so 11 coming in 12 70 percent okay so for the recording, the question on the poll is, do you think this year has been warmer or cooler than average in Williamsburg? Warmer than average, cooler than average, about the same. Not sure, we have 76 votes in, so I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Um, so, right. yeah. Have, yeah, 10 out of 13, 77% of our respondents thinks, think it's been warmer. Uh -huh. um, one person thought cooler and about the same and not sure, one and one and one. So there yeah, we go. So definitely the majority are thinking warmer than average. All right, so let's go to the results. Oops, let's see. Okay. You want me to go back to the results again? Oh no, that's sorry. I'm gonna go to the next slide here. Okay. Okay, so what we are looking at here is a graph of accumulated temperature. And so you might have heard of accumulated growing degree days. This is something that some gardeners are aware of. Um, it's definitely used a lot in agriculture, but it's a way of measuring the amount of heat that's accumulated since the beginning of the year. And the way that it's calculated is there's a base temperature that's used. In this case, we're using 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which is freezing. And so as you start from January 1st, any amount of heat that's above 32 degrees on each day of the year is added to a running total. And so what you get is a accumulated number of degrees since the beginning of the year. So it's in a, a way to measure the amount of kind of measurable heat across the year. And so on the graph, you can see there's a black line. This is a 30 year average. So this is for the location of, I've used this zip code. Uh, hopefully that's the right one for you guys in Williamsburg. Um, so that is um, tracking the, um, the average heat that's accumulated from the period of 1981 to 2010. And that's a, a 30 year average, it's used a lot in climatology. We've actually recently moved to a more recent 30 year average of 1991 to 2020, just because we entered into a new decade. So we're gonna be updating our, our averages this year. Um, but so the black line is showing the average, the blue line is showing this year, so you can see we have the across the um, x-axis here is the days of the year. And here we have the accumulated heat on the y-axis. And so as we start, we can see the relationship of the blue line to the black line. And we can see that at the beginning of the year, you all were running a little bit behind average. So you're lower on this accumulated heat total. And so it was cooler for the first couple months. And then you started to be more on average kind of following that line. Um, for much of the spring and summer. And then more recently, you kind of leapt up above that average. So you are running ahead of normal for accumulated heat. So maybe some of you that answered that uh, warmer than average, you're thinking about the more recent months where it seems like it's been warmer than normal, um, but really for much of the year, you are about on average. And then we can also look at last year, if you can recall back to last year, for much of the spring, you were actually running ahead of normal for that couple first months of the year. So I like to show this graph because often, you know, our kind of feeling about the weather, um, it can be really impacted by short-term events. So if there's a, 
um, a nor'easter or something that comes in, or there's a heat wave for a couple of days that can really impact our feeling and remembering about the weather across the year. Um, but if we look at graphs like this, we can see what information was actually recorded and how this year or last year stacks up to a longer term average. And so plants and animals um, do a great job of responding to these kind of events too in their own way. And so by looking at the, the phenology of plants and animals, we can actually see how they're responding to these differences in temperature. So phenology has a lot of different applications. So we can think about phenology as a great way to understand ecology, um, the relationship between different plants and animals, so phenology can be a way to understand potential mismatches that are happening between plants and pollinators. We can also use phenology for agriculture. So knowing when to plant seeds, when to harvest crops, um, and even when to control for pests of agriculture are all great applications of phenology. Even wildfire season is very impacted by phenology. So you can think about a year where there was a lot of vegetation growth followed by a a rapid um, drying out that can cause a high fuel load, which can mean uh, worse fire season. Also allergies, so knowing about when plants are blooming and releasing pollen, things like juniper, um, then that can really impact the timing of allergy season as, as well as the severity. And then invasive plants and pests. So we um, here in Arizona, we use um, phenology to understand when to treat different invasive grasses, knowing when they're green enough for the herbicide to be effective. And then in pest management as well, um, they often use accumulated growing degree days to know when it's been warm enough for insects to hatch out into the adult phase, which is often for things like emerald ash borer, when they're susceptible to treatments with um, insecticides. So phenology is certainly not a new concept. Um, indigenous people have been paying attention to plant and animal activities um, ever since they've been around. So we can look at examples like the, um, the Algonquin in the Northeast um, used this system of moons to kind of um, track when things are happening in the environment and take certain actions um, to harvest different crops or pay attention to animal resources that might be out there at different times of the year. So some of you might be familiar with some of these different moons where you're tracking different activities that happen during the different times of the year. There's also a number of these kind of proverbs that are out there about the relationship between different plants and animal activities. Um, so some of these are plant corn when oak leaves are the size of a mouse's ear, once lilac flowers have faded, plant squash and cucumbers, when crab apple and wild plum are at bud break, eastern tent caterpillars are hatching. So if you know of any other of these, please put them in the chat. Um, I love to collect these. So I'm always looking for other examples of things that you've heard about. And also Aldo Leopold um, was also a big fan of phenology. And he stated that it's really a horizontal science which transects a lot of different biological profession. So being able to look at phenology and understand the timing of plant and animal activity is really a way to understand the landscape, landscape on a large scale and understand the connection between what's happening with the weather and then how the plants and animals respond. So I would love to hear from you if you keep track of phenology events where you live. So we can launch the next poll. So I'm, I'm wondering if you already document phenology in different ways. And it could be that you just pay attention to these kinds of changes. Maybe you take pictures or you keep a nature, nature journal, or maybe you don't keep track, but maybe you will by the end of the presentation. Okay, I hope, hopefully you're all seeing the tracking methods. Yep, we have um, answers coming in, 66%. So far, most of us are saying, hey, we notice the changes, but don't record them. There we go, 16 of all, we're at 18, 88%, that's awesome. And I'm gonna go ahead and stop here because that's, I think, almost 100% because Aaron and I are not able to um, to vote. <laughs> so the results are 
uh, 69% of us notice the changes but don't record them. Uh, three people, 19% take photographs. Four people say that they um, keep a nature journal. Um, and one person says, I don't keep track yet. So Great. awesome. Yeah, I'm sure that you all notice changes happening. I think anyone that is interested in a botanic garden or a volunteer there is very aware of the changes that are happening out in the environment with plants and animals. So um, yes, hopefully by the end of the presentation, you'll be interested in actually tracking the, the changes that you're seeing. So um, there are many examples of why keeping track of changes are, are very important and um, useful. So this is one example where um, some of you might have heard of Nina Leopold Bradley, Aldo Leopold's daughter. She actually continued on work that was done by her father at the shack in Wisconsin by uh, keeping track of the arrival of different birds up to Wisconsin, as well as the timing of flowering of different plants. And so by looking at the data that her father and her recorded over the years, um, and then comparing that to what's happening in modern times, we can actually see the difference in when different birds were arriving. Um, so birds like sandhill crane and different geese are actually now arriving two to three weeks earlier than they were at the time of um, when Nina Leopold Bradley was younger um, and when her father was recording information. So it's just very useful to have those records. If we didn't have them written down, then we wouldn't be able to look back and compare and see how things are changing now. Another example is uh, Kathleen Anderson is a naturalist in Massachusetts, and she's also kept a nature journal for decades. And by looking at her records of when different birds were arriving, we can see that things are shifting and arrival of birds like wood ducks is shifting by um, many, many weeks from when she first started recording in the 1960s to more recent decades. There's also other examples. So there's a, another um, outdoorsman, L.S. Quackenbush, who was a, a hunter and um, had a, a hunting um, area in uh, Maine. And he was also um, very into documenting what he saw and he was recording a journal um, different timing of when trees would leaf out and flowers were blooming and birds were arriving. And some researchers um, just a couple years ago looked back at his records. This is from the, the mid 19th century. And um, they were able to see that things are shifting pretty consistently for um, things like bud break in trees and flowering of plants. Um, and so those were shifting earlier with um, increases in temperature, but we didn't see a similar increase in bird arrival. He actually found that the birds were not arriving earlier um, in a, a, a similar way to how the plants were shifting, which is a, an area of potential mismatch between the birds and what the plants are doing there in Maine. So because of all of these um, responses that plants and animals have to um, climate variables, it's a great way to document um, climate change and other aspects of environmental change. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change back in 2007 actually stated that phenology is one of the simplest processes to track climate change. It's something that is easy to observe. You can go out and look at what the plants and animals are doing. Um, if you write down what you're seeing, then you can track those changes over time. And it's really just an easy way to record the impact of climate change on the environment. So there are many ways that phenology is shifting. This is a, a paper that kind of provides a, a look at how these changes are showing up. So you can think about um, a particular plant or animal life cycle event would have a first, so when it first starts appearing, like the first appearance of a flower, a peak when the most flowers are maybe open on the plant, and then a last. And so one way that things can shift is kind of evenly across all of those different metrics where you have the peak, the, the first, the peak, and the last are all shifting early. But there can also be other ways that things change where Maybe the first event shifts forward, um, but then the last event stays the same. So that's a lengthening of the growing season. Um, maybe the first shifts early and then the last shifts later. So you have a really long extension of the growing period, um, or maybe it, it contracts. 
And um, you would think that maybe the growing season getting longer would be a good thing in some ways. Um, if you think about the, the growing season of things like deciduous trees is really important for carbon uptake. So that's a good thing for climate change and global warming where we're seeing more plants taking up carbon and it being taken out of the atmosphere. But it actually can be detrimental to plants to have a really long growing season. Um, it can be very energetically expensive for the plants to be growing for that much longer. And it can lead to um, more impacts of things like drought, where it can actually cause the trees to suffer over the long term. Uh, many trees also have what's called a chilling requirement, where they need to have a cold period in order to activate the growth in the springtime. So having these long, early spring seasons can be actually a bad thing for a lot of plants. So one example that's a, a very well-studied system of how some of these changes can play out for an ecosystem is a, a system in Northern Africa and Europe. So this bird is called the Pied Flycatcher. And each year it migrates from Northern Africa um, across the Mediterranean up to Europe. And um, the bird typically uh, relies on the angle of the sun or the day length to know when it's time to go up and migrate to its breeding grounds. When it arrives up into Europe, it will lay its eggs. And over time it has evolved to do that so that when its nestlings come out of the shells, um, there's an abundance of caterpillars for the adults to feed to their young. But in recent decades, um, things have been shifting with warmer spring temperatures. We're getting earlier leaf out of things like oak trees. And then um, we also have uh, earlier hatching of caterpillars, which rely on those young leaves on the trees. And so what's happening is the caterpillars and the oaks are moving earlier, but the birds, which are relying on the day length, which hasn't changed, are still arriving at the same time. So by the time the nestlings emerge, um, the caterpillars have already gone into their chrysalis, and so they're not available for the adults to feed to their young anymore. And so there's actually been a, a wide scale decrease in the populations of the pied flycatcher there. Um, and so it's, it's really been a large impact on those birds. And they're suspecting that there's going to be kind of this um, trickle down effect of, of what's happening with the birds to other things in the ecosystem as well. So closer to home, there's a, a number of researchers have looked at the impacts um, similarly here in the United States. So there was a study done a number of years ago that looked at a, a suite of different neotropical migrants that come from Central and South America up to um, the Eastern part of the US each spring. And so these birds are similarly to the applied flycatcher, they're relying on insects that are tied to when these trees, the big kind of dominant overstory trees are leafing out. Um, and that's when the caterpillars like to, to feed on them. And they found that there are several birds, the nine here um, that are pictured, are not able to keep up with the shifts that are happening in the vegetation and the insects. So they're worried that there's kind of this decoupling between when the birds are arriving and when the food is available. Um, so they, they have these birds kind of identified as ones to watch um, that might be potentially impacted by the decrease in food resources and may see um, a wide scale decrease in population. So there are other impacts too of these shifts in phenology. So if you think about a deciduous forest in the springtime, there's often a period of time in the spring where things start to warm up, but the overstory trees have not yet leafed out. And this is a really critical time for understory plants. This is often the, the time when they get the most sunlight because the trees haven't leafed out yet. Um, so we have a lot of those spring ephemerals and then there's um, little animals like lizards and salamanders and, and birds that are really taking advantage of that understory. Um, but as the, the climate has been shifting, the um, warming of the spring temperatures earlier in the year um, has actually enabled those bigger trees to leaf out earlier. They're, they're able to keep up with that shift. And so they're blocking out that sunlight at that critical period where they're not really allowing those, those plants on the ground, which are not as able to take advantage of those early springs and so those plants are seeing wide scale decreases as well. So there are many, many other examples of how things are shifting. So I just listed a bunch of things on here of which um, different plants and, and animals are seeing a shift in the springtime um, and shifting their phenologies. So this, uh, I won't go through all of these, but it's just a kind of a, 
a big picture look at how everything really is, is seeing shifts in different ways. There are also, um, in addition to shifts in the springtime, shifts in autumn phenology as well. So uh, for things like bird departures, um, some birds are seeing an advancing of when that happens in the fall, um, going back to their, their summer or their, their winter grounds in the, the southern part of the continent. Um, and some are getting delayed depending on what kinds of bird they are. Um, similarly with insects, some are shifting to an a earlier activity in the fall and some are later. Um, and then with fruit, most things are ripening earlier um, in the fall, but a few are, are um, ripening later. And then leaf senescence as well. You might've noticed that um, in some years, the autumn leaf color um, is shifting to a different time. So um, in years where it is drier, it seems that autumn phenology shifts to earlier. So you would see an earlier fall color, um, but in wetter years, it might be later in the year. So I would love to hear from you about what kinds of changes you've noticed where you are. Um, I just have a few examples here, but you can pick as many of these as you want. I'm just curious if you have noticed any of these changes happening. Okay, so I've launched the poll and the questions are, and I'm going to repeat this because this does not show up in the recording. What changes have you noticed where you live? Winter is getting warmer. There's more variegation when spring arrives or in the timing of it. Trees are leafing out earlier or blooming earlier. Trees with new buds are getting hit by frost more often and autumn leaf color is not as bright as it used to be. Uh, by the way, I will give this a few, few more seconds. Erin, I very quickly looked up the zip code that you used and um, you actually gave us the data for Williamsburg, West Virginia. That's okay, that's okay. Um, it, it's a very different um, climate. We're, our elevation is 82 feet here in Williamsburg, Virginia, because we're on the coastal plain um, next to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, in Williamsburg, West Virginia is four hours west on the other side of the Blue Mid, or in the Blue Ridge Mountains. And uh, there, its elevation is 2,192 feet. So we have some obvious differences, but I, I, I'm sure that you know, we have uh, a, a similar graph if we were to get our results. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry, I'm not as familiar yeah. with the zip codes there. Yeah, well, if you wanna look up your own zip code, I can give you the, the link to that. We have a visualization tool where you can plug it in and then see it. So, and we, oh. if we have time at the end, we can look at it together too. That'd be awesome. Okay, I'm gonna end this poll. And here are the results. Uh, 13 people say, yep, it's getting more. They've noticed that winter is, is warmer. Um, eight people have noticed that there's more variation in the timing of spring arrival. Um, seven people noticed that trees are leafing out or blooming earlier. And five people said that they noticed that trees with new buds are getting hit by frost more often. And 10 people um, agree that autumn leaf color does not seem to be as bright as it used to be. So I'll stop that share. All right, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, it's good to know what, what you guys are seeing on the ground there. So thanks for answering that. All right, All right. so given that there um, is a great way to track these changes that are happening in plants and animals, um, back in, the mid 2000s, um, it was recognized that there wasn't really a standardized way to document these changes. Um, there are a lot of people that were kind of, you know, paying attention in different ways, maybe keeping journals or keeping different types of Excel spreadsheets, but there wasn't a, a standardized way to do this. So a bunch of different organizations came together and decided that there should be a national phenology network as a way to document these changes on a wide scale. So we were established back in 2007 um, as really the way to collect, store, and share phenology information across the United States. So we have four main kind of tenets at the network. Um, we seek to inform decisions, advance science, communicate and connect about phenology, and then create an equitable and inclusive network. So I'm just going to go through each of these in a little bit more detail. 
So we like to work with natural resource managers. Um, Judith mentioned that I work closely with people from the Fish and Wildlife Service, but we also have partnerships with the National Park Service, um, the Forest Service, and, and many other people that are working on natural resource management. And what we try to do is give them the phenology information that they need to make decisions. So one example is there's a, a bat, a nectar bat here in the Southwest called the lesser long nose bat. And it was recently delisted from the endangered species list. But as part of that delisting, natural resource managers here needed to make sure that the population is okay and, and it's gonna be maintained. So they wanna keep track of the food availability and how that is matching up with the timing of when the bats um, come up here during their summer migration. So we're actually documenting the flowering of cactus and agave across the state here and trying to keep track of how those things might be changing over time. We also advance science. So we have um, all of the information that is recorded through the network is made freely available. And we've had over a hundred peer reviewed publications using the data that are collected. Um, and people are using it in a number of different ways to answer questions about um, basic understanding of when plant life cycle events happen, what are the drivers of those events um, in terms of the temperature or precipitation or those kind of aspects. Um, and then we've also had our, our data and information used in a number of um, policy documents, um, the EPA climate change indicators, um, as well as the national climate assessments have used phenology information from our network. We also communicate and connect about phenology. So we try to make sure that everyone's kind of aware of the most recent science that's happening. Uh, we have lots of phenology education resources and we run a number of different newsletters that you can sign up for to kind of stay up to date on what's happening with phenology information. And then we try to ensure that phenology data and information is available and of use to everyone in the US population. So we try to work with different groups. Uh, we have the Indigenous Phenology Network where we're working with um, a number of different tribes across the country um, to try to help them use phenology in their own way. You know, it might not look the same as it does um, with our, our data collection program, but we're trying to work together to support them in, in achieving any goals that they have for keeping track of phenology changes and then using them to um, make any decisions or um, just to understand how things are changing. So the primary way that we record phenology information is our program called Nature's Notebook. And Nature's Notebook is a program that is used by both professional and volunteer scientists. Um, you might have heard these folks also called citizen scientists or community scientists. There's lots of different terms, um, but really, Research has shown that the data that's collected by citizen scientists or volunteer scientists is really of high quality. When these people receive training, um, their data is just as reliable as those that are trained professionals. So it's very important for us to be able to kind of reach out to people across the country and invite them to participate. Um, we wouldn't be able to collect the information that we do by hiring you know, a small number of people. So by being able to leverage the power of kind of crowdsourcing out our science, um, we're able to document a lot of different phenology um, happening across the country. And it's estimated that the, the efforts of volunteers actually contribute billions annually to understanding biodiversity. So it's very, very valuable. And we really appreciate all of the efforts of volunteer scientists across the country. So we have lots of people that are documenting chronology through Nature's Notebook across the United States. Uh, you can see here on the map shows the different stations that we have collecting data. And then the size of those little circles actually is how much data um, are coming in from different spots. So you can see that um, a lot of the dots kind of follow urban centers across the country. So we have a lot of people along the coast and around major cities. We also have a few circles that you'll see that are kind of in more remote areas. And those are actually stations that belong to the National Ecological Observatory Network or NEON. That is an effort that was started um, about a decade ago. And they're also using our data collection platform to collect phenology data. So you'll see there are some spots where we have a lot of information. 
Um, so we do have over 20,000 active observers across the country, and we are over 26 million records um, that have been submitted to the National Phenology Database. Uh, these typically are from about 2010 onward, although we do have some people that have entered data from previous years using our platform. So we have some data going back to the, the 50s, but most of the data are more contemporary in the last decade or so. So I wanted to get into a little bit on how we track phenology and kind of the way that it looks in our data collection system. So we use what we call phenophases, which is just a fancy word for life cycle events. For animals and plants, it's a little bit different. So with animals, we want you to record at the level of the species. Um, we, we're not able to know if it's the same individual that you're seeing every time. So we ask you to use a checklist to record which species you see. And um, then for the ones you do see, we wanna know about what's happening. What are those animals doing? So we want you to record things about the activity, maybe the feeding that you observe. Um, was, it, was the bird feeding on insects or was it eating seeds? Um, reproduction, so we wanna know if you see a bird carrying nesting material. And then development, we wanna know if you see um, nestlings in the nest or if those nestlings have fledged. With plants, you're actually recording individual plants, the same individuals over time. So we actually have you tag one or more plants and you go back to those same plants year after year. And then the, so the power of that is you can actually see the differences in the phenology from year to year. So you might have a, a, like a sugar maple tree where you're going back to that same tree each year and you might notice that the flowering is earlier in some years than it is in other years. And because you're looking at that same individual, it's a really powerful way to see the changes that are happening in climate and how that's impacting that plant. So with plants, we have you record different questions about the leaves, the flowers, and the fruits. And so just to get into a little more detail, um, there's different ways to record phenology information. Some methods are you just record the first time something happens. So you would record the first time you saw a flower or the first time you saw a fruit. We actually do status monitoring where we want you to go multiple times over the year and tell us whether you saw something happening, but also whether you didn't see it happening. So the, we call those the no observations or the negative observations. And so if you go and look at your tree, um, it doesn't have any activity happening on it, you would answer no for all of the questions that we have on the data sheet. Um, and that's a really great way for us to be able to pinpoint when something does happen. So if someone looks at your data, they can see a bunch of no records and then all of a sudden a yes record. And depending on how often you are observing, that helps us pinpoint when that life cycle event started happening. So let's say you went out two days ago and nothing was happening on, on your tree. And then today you see that the buds have emerged and you see the little leaf tips. And so that tells us that within a two day period, we know when that started happening. If you were only going once a month, that would be a much bigger period, so a lot more uncertainty. And then the other thing that happens with the status monitoring is you can record multiple periods of activity. So for things like we have a lot of plants here in the Southwest that have multiple flowering periods, it's really linked to rainfall. And so we could record the first time the flowering happens and then the last, and then if that happens again, we actually can record both of those flowering periods. And then we actually have an additional step as well, uh, which we call the abundance or the intensity questions. And so that allows you to record not only a presence absence or yes or no question, but also how many did you see? So how many buds did you see? Um, how many flowers? What percent of those flowers were open? And we have some bins to help you estimate those quantities because for some of these trees, it can be a, a lot to count. So we try to give you a, a way to easily estimate. And that really lets us get at the peak in when that was happening. So when was the peak in open flowers or the most nectar available for pollinators. So here is a look at um, one of our protocols for flowering dogwood. And uh, we do have protocols or, or um, data sheets for uh, over 1400 different species of plants and animals. So for this dogwood data sheet, you can see that we have questions about leaves. We have questions about flowers and questions about fruits. And so for each of these questions, we're asking you, did you see this happening? And so for each one, you circle a yes or a no. We also have a question mark. So if you're not sure, you can circle that. And then you can always go back and update your data later. 
And so for these different phenophases, we really want you to use the definitions that we've provided. So you don't have to try to guess at what a breaking leaf bud is or what a, an open flower means. So we have, I have here the definition. So for flowering, we're really interested on in um, when the reproductive parts are visible on the plant. Um, so we try to give you some specific information. And even for the fruit definitions, we have species specific information. So for flowering dogwood, we tell you the fruit is berry like and changes from green to bright red. So it gives you all the information you need, although you all are probably pretty familiar with plants there. So you might already know this information, but we're trying to make sure that everyone's kind of on the same page and doesn't need a lot of training to be able to answer the questions. And then the, um, the space here next to the question mark, that's where you would record um, the intensity or the abundance. And we give you those bins here. So you would put it in a bin of less than three, three to 10, 11 to 100, and so on. Um, and just a general estimate of how many um, you see on the plant. Here is an example of one of our animal protocols for the monarch butterfly. So this has um, activity questions and breeding questions and questions about development. And these are also yes or no. Um, and so we also give you definitions for these to, to try to help you answer those questions as well. For the abundance information for animals, we're just looking for a, a raw number. So you might say, I saw three butterflies. And so you'd write a three on that line there. So here is a little pop quiz if you want to try to answer one of our, our data sheets. So look at the picture and try to see all the different things that are happening there. And then Judith will launch the poll that will ask you about which of these phenophases do you see on this plant? And you can answer more than one. Okay. So the pheno, the question is, what phenophases do you see in this photo of the dogwood? Um, the options are leaves, flower buds, open flowers, and fruits. The answers are coming in and I'm glad I'm wearing my headset because indeed the construction has started on my front wow. porch. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm hearing a uh, bang, bang, bang. And uh, I anticipate the sound of a sawzall coming soon. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Ah, oh. right. got 15 of 18 participants. Mm -hmm. All right, we're at a minute so after this poll, so I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Um, so 15 said that we see leaves, 8 said we see flower buds, 14 said we see open flowers, and 7 said we see fruits. Erin, how, how did we do? Okay, so I should have said this is a little bit of a trick question. Now, uh -oh. dogwoods are a tricky one. And I, I don't know if anyone wants to put in the chat what they might know about dogwood flowers. But something that is um, interesting about dogwoods is they have these white things here, which are actually not petals, but they are bracts. And so the flowers are actually these little tiny things right in the center. And if you recall back to the definition that we have, and I can go back and we'll look at it, we're looking at when the reproductive parts are visible and that's when we know it's an open flower. So if you look at this picture, this is where we actually see an open flower. And it's, um, it's a tricky question because it's this tiny little structure here. So the previous photo, we would just say we see flower buds. And we see leaves. Um, there are no fruits here yet. Remember that that definition said the fruit is actually a bright red uh, fruit. So we don't see that. But here I would say I see leaves, I see flower buds, and I see open flowers. And I would say a no for fruits. So sorry, a little bit of a trick question, but um, it's a special thing about dogwoods um, is they have those big white bracts. Uh, we appreciate trick questions. <laughs> So we have a couple different ways that you can enter data into the Nature's Notebook program. So some people like the old fashioned paper data sheets. You can print those out from the website and take them outside with you. And then you would go back online or maybe hand them to a friend who's good with computers and they can enter for you the data onto the website. Um, and then you can also use our app 
uh, which we have available. It works offline as well. Um, it works over just Wi-Fi if you don't want to use data. And so you can do that and then have the data automatically go right into the database and not have to worry about a two-step process. We have a number of different training resources. So we have an online course um, that has multiple modules. We're still working on a couple modules, but we have um, a few of the basic ones that are already completed. And that really tells you all you need to know about how you would set up an observation site and how you register different plants and animals, um, recommendations for how to do the, the phenology observations over time. And then we have some more advanced modules about um, learning about the different phenophases for different types of plants. Um, and we're working on some, um, some quizzes as well. We also have this information in a printable PDF. And we also have a botany primer, which is available on the website. And this is all of the botany that you need to know for Nature's Notebook. It's full of great photographs and it has a lot of concepts about botany that are helpful, kind of understanding um, pollination and when a, a fruit becomes ripe and all that kind of stuff. And you can print out the guide, you can look at it online. You can also order a printed copy. Um, I think it's, it's less than $20. It basically covers the printing and the shipping costs. Um, but it's a nice um, kind of spiral bound guide that you can order as well. Um, and then when it comes to volunteer science, people always ask about data quality. Um, like, do I really know that the data is gonna be great quality if you're using volunteers? And we have a whole document on the website that talks all about that if you're interested, but we do have several quality measures. We, we focus a lot on the training, you know, the, the online certification course that we have, um, the phenophase definitions that we provide to try to ensure the quality of the data coming in. And then we also have a number of measures we do to flag the data if there's things that, you know, they don't look quite right to help people that are using the data to um, pick out things that might be wrong with the data. And then we're also compliant with federal policy. So um, we have the Privacy Act and the Mobile Security Act and all that kind of stuff. We have a number of data collection campaigns as well. So if you're unsure, uncertain about what you might want to track, um, I would suggest starting here. We have our um, Nectar Connectors campaign, which is focused on pollinator plants. That might be something that's of interest to you all there at the garden. Uh, we have a green wave campaign that focuses on maples, oaks, and poplars. We have a pest patrol campaign where you're looking for insect pests, things like emerald ash borer, um, hemlock woolly adelgid. And we have our lilacs and dogwoods campaign, uh, which also might be of interest for you all. And I think I have some more information about, yeah, the flowering dogwoods. So in this campaign, we're interested in the um, leaf out and the flowering of dogwoods. And um, you can see here, we've been running this campaign for several years now, and we can start to see, I think this is a location in, I don't remember, I think this might be Virginia, actually, um, the state of Virginia, but um, you can see here the proportion of the yes records that people reported for flowering and how that changes a little bit from year to year. So we have um, this year, 2018 was pretty early compared to the other years. And then we have um, later flowering years um, like 2021, actually this was just starting out when I, I did this graph. So it was happening a little bit later than this early year here. Um, but we can see the, the different observation stations here where people are tracking dogwoods across the um, Eastern part of the country. You can also use the, the Nectar Connectors campaign. So this has um, 53 different species of nectar plants. Um, they're species that are important for monarchs, but other pollinators as well. Uh, so we have a number of milkweeds and thistles and other types of pollinator plants here. Um, and you can see this graph here shows um, the last several years of information about milkweeds and when those were flowering. Um, so we, we have um, a couple of campaigns that are, they were initiated by natural resource managers. So this campaign was actually begun because the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, this was a few years ago when they were starting the, the process of trying to decide whether or not to list the monarch butterfly on the endangered species list. And they ask us for more information about the nectar availability to know, you know, is it becoming mismatched with when the monarchs are doing their migration? And so we've been collecting data for several years to try to help them understand um, when the nectar plants are blooming and where that is happening across the country to see whether it's lining up with where the, the monarchs are on their migration. 
Um, but they're, these flowers are used by a lot of different pollinators, so it's of interest to, um, to many different pollinator species. We have a number of incentives for observing. So we have a leaderboards page where you can see how your number of observations stacks up to other people across the country. We also have badges. These are what I showed earlier with the campaign. So each campaign has a, a badge you can earn for participating. We also have other badges for different numbers of observations or which species you've been monitoring. Even um, recording no observations for animals is our empty nest badge, um, just so you can kind of see the importance of uh, recording those negative data. We have a visualization tool that allows you to look at not only your own data, but data from um, people all across the country. And we have a lot of different ways to do that. I've shown a couple of these, we call these activity curves that show kind of the peak in activity. We also have, these are called phenology calendars, which show the yes or no observations that people have reported. The colored lines are the yeses and the gray lines are the noes. We also have scatter plots, which allow you to compare the phenology to climate data or um, even things like latitude. So this is showing for um, maples, this is I think across the Eastern United States, uh, when did the maples first start leafing out and how did that compare to whether you're south or north across the country? You can see that at lower latitudes, we have earlier leaf out than at northern latitudes. And that's um, an example from that green wave campaign. So if you go to the visualization tool, the link here, um, we have a number of seasonal stories and those are also tutorials to help you learn how to use the tool and explore it and look at different species. Um, and there you can also find that place where you can enter your, your actual zip code for Williamsburg, Virginia and um, see the accumulated temperature there where you are. Um, so we, I mentioned we um, have the, the data are used by researchers for peer reviewed publications and um, different documents like the indicators reports. So many, many different examples of how the data have been used. Um, just a couple of them. So we have a, a study that was done a number of years ago on the common milkweeds that are recorded in Nature's Notebook found that um, these are the different locations where the milkweed data were taken from Nature's Notebook. Um, and you can see here, this is looking at when flowering was happening. So the mean day of the year that it happened, this is earlier in the year versus later. And then how does that relate to the temperature in that location? And we can see that as the temperatures increase here on the right, we have earlier flowering. And so um, the worry is, you know, as temperatures increase, milkweed starts flowering earlier. Maybe that doesn't line up to when the pollinators are um, needing the nectar. Uh, also black cherry flowering, there's a study that was done using nature's notebook data that looked at um, how the black cherry flowering is shifting earlier over the decades. And so this shows again the day of the year here on the y axis so um, it used to be later that flowering would happen and then in more recent years it's becoming earlier. We can see that pretty cl clearly on the graph there. And then this was a, a, one of our Nature's Notebook campaigns that ended a couple of years ago, but this was looking at the difference between native shrubs and invasive shrubs. And this is thinking back to those, um, those overstory trees when they have their, their leaves, um, they haven't had their leaves come out yet in the springtime. Um, that's when the understory really needs that sunlight. And so they found that invasive shrubs are actually really able to take advantage of that time period when there's sunlight coming down and they're able to leaf out a lot earlier than the native shrubs. And you can see this really clearly where, um, especially at Southern latitudes, we're seeing that um, invasive shrubs are leafing out much earlier than native shrubs um, and taking advantage of that early sunlight and kind of blocking out the native shrubs. And so they're able to kind of outcompete. Um, lastly, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our local phenology program. So as a nature's notebook observer, you can do this in your own backyard. So that would be setting up your own observation site and documenting whatever you want there in your, your backyard or maybe another location nearby. Um, but you can also participate as part of a group of observers. And that's what we call a local phenology program. We have a lot of these hundreds of them across the country. And we have a lot of resources that we make available for these folks. Um, so we have an online certification course for local phenology leaders, which are people who lead these programs. 
we have a lot of program planning resources. We walk you through how to do an action plan, a logic model, a sustainability plan. Um, and then we also have a number of um, different resources about volunteer recruitment and retention. So lots of things to help you get started with a program. Um, we also have a community of practice that um, we have a monthly call every month where we bring together all of our leaders and they can share resources. And um, we also have um, a newsletter as well as a forum. So it's a great way for people to kind of build off of what um, each other have done and um, really leverage resources and things like that. So this map shows um, these little green dots are all of the local phonology program sites. And then the black dots are the personal sites or the you know, individual backyard locations. So you can see that there are a lot of different local phonology programs um, across the country. And this is just a, a small set of um, some of the different organizations that are participating um, with the local phonology programs. So uh, we did a we do an annual survey each year of our local phonology program. So this is just a, showing you kind of the breakdown of the types of organizations that we have represented. And you can see that the number one contributing type of local phonology program are botanic gardens. And so we, we really love working with these kinds of organizations um, because you all are very familiar with plants and um, already kind of used to looking at the changes that are happening and, and you know paying close attention. So we're very interested in working with botanic gardens. This is one example of um, uh, an arboretum that is in West Virginia, the West Virginia University Core Arboretum. Um, and some of the data that they have um, collected over the years, they've been going for a number of years now. And you can see they're recording flowering dogwood. And so you can see this example from this year shows they record the uh, initial growth of the plant the open flowers and, um, and then the fruits as well. And you can see kind of the timing of those different things over the year. And then um, this also shows the number of years of data that they've collected. And so looking at how open flowers has changed over the year, you can see that back in 2017, it was a pretty early year for flowering. Um, and then 2020 was a little bit later of a year for open flowers. So it's really powerful once you have number, a number of years of data to be able to look and see um, how that has changed over time. And then you can start to look at how that might um, compare to different climate variables like temperature, precipitation, and things like that. So I would love to hear from you all now, could you see yourself as a nature's notebook observer? So that, I think this is our last poll here. All right, so the poll is launched. Do you see yourself becoming a nature's notebook observer? Yep, I'm ready to sign up. And I am very excited because I would like the Williamsburg Botanical Garden to be your 28th <laughs> botanical garden involved. Um, is there a site close by that is already um, part of the part of the org that botanical garden? You can answer that question later. Yeah, we can take a look at that. I, I did look a little bit. I didn't see anything that was really close by, but um, okay. I can look, yeah, and let you know. But we're actually working on, we get this question all the time, like, who is active near me? So we're working on a map that will be on our website where you could actually go and look and see. And then we'll hopefully have some contact information for other local phonology programs. So if you wanted to get in touch and ask them, what are you guys observing? What plants are you focused on? You could do that. So it's in the works, but we don't have it right now. Okay, well, I'm going to end the poll. Um, and we have six people who said, yeah, I'm ready to sign up. And I, some said they need more information. Some said not sure. And we have some probably not right now. Um, I, oh, I'm sorry. I should have I'm supposed to click share the results. But um, I am... I see this as just dovetailing with what the garden already is doing. And so, yay, yay. <laughs> I'm excited. That's great, yay. All right, so this is just kind of a summary of different ways you can participate, but um, 
right now you can go onto the Nature's Notebook website and sign up to be a backyard observer um, that is just um, creating an account. You just need an email and a password. And then it asks you about where you want to have your site. So you can pick, you know, put in your address if you want um, and then add different plants and animals that you're interested in. Um, if you want to look at our campaigns, joining the campaign just means you sign up to be on a newsletter list to get information about the campaign. We send out um, resources about how to identify species and uh, how to look for the different life cycle stages. And then we give results about what other people are seeing. Or if you'd like to create your local phenology program, um, we can do that as well. And maybe I'll be in touch with Judith about that, but that's just setting up a local phenology program in our system and then anyone can join that um, and then contribute information. So thank you so much for listening and learning about phenology today. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that have come in. Um, and then I also put my contact information if you want to follow up later. Okay, um, I, I did a click. We're, we are a small group. So I did a click that says ask all to unmute. There, the only thing that can, has come in through chat so far is when doves begin cooing, plant your corn. Uh huh. Um, but if anyone has a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and pop right on in. Uh, crickets. <laughs> well, if we have time, we can go and look at the Viz tool and we can put in the, <laughs> the correct zip code. That would um, be great. Yes. Yeah, let me, I'm going to pull that up and then I'll reshare my screen. I just want to get the visualization tool up here. I have a comment from Susie. Thank you so much for this thoughtful program. I know I personally, uh, I've been living here in Williamsburg for 10 years and I have seen changes, um, especially in the butterfly population. Now there's a lot of factors that impact that, but timing and, and um, I, I mean, it, it's, I'm babbling here. Um, it really is the fact that everything is connected. Yeah, it is for sure. So, okay, I wanted to show how to get to the visualization tool. So if you are on the usanpn.org website, go to the data menu and then you see the visualization tool right here. And then click on this button to get into the tool and it'll load. So these are the seasonal stories that I mentioned, which are ways that you can kind of explore different questions about what's happening with phenology and then learn how to use the tool and the different types of visualization. So this is where we can type in the zip code and um, see the accumulation curve. So do you want to give me the zip code? 23185. All right. So this says... might take a second to load. So this is going to tell me some information and all the, the seasonal stories have this. It tells you, what are you looking at? What does this tell me? And how can I modify this? So it kind of runs through and gives you some explanation for each of these here. So it'll, it'll take a minute to load, but again, just to kind of reorient you to what we're looking at, we have the, the date across the, the X axis here. So we're starting out February and going through the end of the year. Um, and then on the Y axis here, we have the accumulated growing degree days, which is the amount of heat. And so let me take off the, um, you can do different things here. I'm gonna take off last year just so we're not looking at too much at once here. So we are looking at the um, black line is the long-term average and then 2021 is the blue line. So you are still um, a little different than the, the other one we were looking at, but you've been actually lagging behind this year for most of the year behind the average. Um, and really haven't caught up too much, except for this is the little red line is the forecast for the next six days. So that's showing that um, it's gonna get maybe even a little bit warmer in the next couple of days than average. So then if we put the last year back on, last year was actually pretty warm. Um, maybe that feels like it, it's right to you, hopefully in your mind, but um, even throughout the year from early in January, all the way through to the end of the year, last year was running ahead of normal. Wow, that's remarkable. 
to see it in graph form like that. Yeah. Does that seem right to anyone or does it seem totally wrong for you, from your memory? It seems right to me. Okay. It really does. And we've had another comment come in saying, thanks so much. Very interesting. Um, yeah. Well, we will figure out how to get the garden on, you know, as a new site and we'll start gathering people to get involved with this because it is very exciting stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I always recommend when you're starting out with a new program um, to start small, you know, and maybe pick out a couple things that you'd like to track. Uh, we've also found that programs that have a, um, a science question that they're trying to answer. So you can come up with a question about, you know, are, are the pollinator plants flowering at the same time as when the pollinators are there? Or maybe something about the dogwoods. Um, when are the, the dogwoods flowering? And is that changing from year to year? But if you have kind of a concrete question, it really helps to guide your selection of species for one. But also it allows you to know kind of what you're looking at and kind of um, motivate the people that are observing so they know what they're looking for. And then it, it kind of gives you a guideline for what information to share back with the observers. And we have lots and lots of resources to help you do that, you know, with the visualization tools to help you um, easily make a, a nice graph to share back and, and tell people what they're seeing. Well, this is often um, awesome. We've had several comments, wonderful program. Thank you. Thank you, great program. And I, as I say, I, I'm quite excited about the possibilities here. And Great. thank you again. So you have you have your full entire day ahead of you. <laughs> Whereas we're you know we're we're at the point where we're coming up on eleven thirty. But um, thank you so much for joining us early and sharing this information. Um, more another pro, uh, comment. Excellent program. Good to learn about. Very informative. So thank you, Erin, and thank you all for joining us. We'll uh, send out the link to the recording as soon as possible. So thanks. thanks have a, so much for having me. Have a great day, everyone. And bye-bye.